Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the House of the Deaf podcast with Rafael Calantonio. My name is Peter Salnikov and this time, as usual, we've got a very special guest, uh, one of the key people behind Bioshock series, Thief the Dark Project and many other wonderful games, the legendary Ken Levin. Hello and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm a big fan. This is fantastic. You are entering the house of the dead. So this time we're going to talk about storytelling in video games and how to use the tools that only video games can provide you to tell a touching story. I mean, many people uh, are used to compare video games uh, and movies since both are audiovisual art. But I've been playing games for almost all my life and I think that video games have much more in common with books than any other medium. A great book makes problems of its characters your problems. The same happens when you play a great game. It gets inside your brain. Games like Deus Ex, Dishonored, Bioshock, they take place half-time on screen, half-time in your imagination. This may sound a bit abstract, but let's talk about this magic. I, I don't think you're wrong at all. I think that, I mean, just to like, to, 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 it's a big thing you said, so let me just sort of go down on one little corner of it, like narrative. From a structural standpoint, game narrative is much broader than, you know, because you have, you know, 15, 20 hours, whatever, of, of time to deliver narrative. Um, you know, I, to take Bioshock and turn it into a movie script would be trickier than turning it into a novel because you have, you know, there's like 30 characters and, you know, and some of them just have very small little bit of stories. That's a great thing you do in novels to just like follow a little character for like the last five hours of their life, right? And just, you know, spend the time with that guy and get to know him. And then um, and you can do that in a game where you really can't in a movie. And um, so you can have that kind of leisurely pace and have that much, much broader canvas to work on. Yeah. You know, uh, you said something interesting about the... Uh, Ken said something about the, um, the length, I think. And uh, like in a, even in a movie or even a TV show, I think you have usually three acts kind of thing. I mean... To be sure, maybe not. It's, it's a little longer than that. But I, I always find it di very, very difficult to write stories that are gonna match the pace because the, the the game is a mix of there's a story and then on top of that there's also the player having to usually kill people and find its way and you know do things and uh, and and so you have to stretch the story. It's it's really hard to bring that that those two things together. Much much harder than I think people think uh, because. A lot of people they will they will write a story down and think like, look, if you work with a, someone who comes from the movies, they just they just have those wonderful script and you map a game onto it and it's going to be fun, right? It's going to be amazing. Why don't you do that? Yeah, I mean, we had, I actually use a th strangely, even though it's sort of like I was talking about the novelistic spread. I actually use three act structure pretty much in almost everything I do, just because it's. It gives you, you know, like Bioshock, you know, Jack tries to get to the submarine and then the submarine blows up and that leads to Act 2 where he tries to kill Andy Ryan and then he meets Ryan and then Act 3 and he learns all those things about himself. And, act, and that's very, it's for structure in a very similar um, fashion to um, screenplays. Yeah. I like the player to have a big sort of macro goal in mind and that macro goal is going to last for a while, you know, but then you have all those sub micro goals underneath that. Um, so, you know, while you're trying to get to the submarine, you're, you know, you have to get to the medical district and then you have to, you know, get to, to the, um, the fisheries and all those things you have to do in, in, a, in, in a row to do that. But meanwhile, they're also sort of encountering all these other stories of all the, you know, the citizens of Rapture and, trying to figure out who you are and learning about Sander Cohen and learning about Dr. Steinman and all these little stories you could tell where if you try to put that in a movie, you would just basically get the guys trying to get out of rapture thing. Um, and you would, that's right. Yeah. We don't really have time to dig into like Sander Cohen for like, you know, three hours or four hours like we do in the game. And how do you remind, because if you, if you go for a uh, three acts on over 20 hours of game, for example, uh, how do you remind the player of the context of the first act, for example, because it is stretched over many hours, right? So 
Yeah. Well, we have a couple of advantages. Like in Bioshock, you know, it, it, um, you know, it was fairly linear, right? So you had um, the player just basically that game was really like walk down the corridor, yeah, um, and 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 get to the end of it. It's harder in a more open, you know, in an open in an open world end of game. But we also keep the um, the things you have to do in Act One are very simple. You know, Act One, like talk about Bioshock again. You know, get to the submarine. Act Two, kill Andrew Ryan. Act Three, you know, um, get out of the city. You know, then either free little sisters or don't. Um, but you want something that's simple enough that it, you don't really need a lot of proper nouns to understand it or explain it. You know, it's just like really basic stuff. And I think that's yeah. what was good act structure in film as well, is that you have this sort of very a skeletal thing that you always sort of know, or even in some films, if you read what reader, um, Raiders of Lost Ark is structured that literally in every scene, if you ask Indiana Jones what he's trying to do, he would answer the same question every scene, get the Ark, right? Even when he finds a Marion in that tent, you know, held by the Nazis, what does he do? He puts the, you know, he leaves her there because his goal is to get the Ark and, and not to get Marion. And so you, simplicity can really be your friend in storytelling. I think that's a hard thing to learn as a storyteller because you want to, you want to overwhelm people with your, you know, with your, you know, George R. R. Martin, breadth and depth and brilliance and, um, or, you know, Dickensian kind of um, storyscape. But if you lose that thread with people in a game, especially because they're so busy, you know, they're, they're shooting things and they're collecting things <laughs> and they're yeah. um, you know, going through physical skills. And then, like you said, they put the game away and they come back a month later sometimes because they get frustrated. Um, I feel we have an extra responsibility to keep it really, really, really basic. Like I love like the new God of War, you know, um, your mom, you know, your mom's dead. You have to take her to, to, to the top of the mountaintop and, and um, have her funeral essentially. And that works on two reasons. One is there's the mountain, right? Your, your stakes are really gettable. You know, this woman is so important to you has died to both of you. And, and, um, the emotional stakes are, are are really clear. You want to hold a funeral for her. It's so much better than, you know, oh, the Lord, you know, Zazog has invented, you know, has, has invaded our quadraverse and yeah. to collect the, you know, the whatever, because it's, it's, um, it's gettable and it's simple and it's, you know, on the screen a lot of the time. It's interesting because I, I personally, I find myself battling between the, the overarching story, which at the end is, it's really a motive, it's really a, an excuse for the player to move forward. Uh, and the more micro stories, which personally I find most of the time most more interesting because they're more mundane and more relatable. It's less about saving the world, but it's more about helping a specific person, usually, and there's something emotional that is interesting to me. Yet, it's always, always, uh, it's been always a nightmare to reconcile with the gameplay every time you know we stretch things one way stretching another way kill this thing and then now things don't hold up together and now the player is lost he doesn't know what to do uh it's such a hard exercise i find it so so hard like there's a uh, the the delta between like the paper version we start with and the where we end is is so large in, in my case i don't know if you've experienced the same thing yeah i mean um well i think both believers in sort of you know not being married to your original ideas. I think, you know, most really experienced developers understand that that initial idea is really just exactly that. It's an initial idea. Um, like a lot of times, I'm sure you get this question too. I get asked like, you know, um, how much did it change from your original idea? And I'm like, the original idea was nothing. You know, it, it was, it was a direction to walk in, you know? And, um, and I'm not sure if it's maybe I just you know work differently than most people. But I think you, I, I think from, you know, I think we've talked about you know I've had these conversations before. Um, it's the iterative process is, is is you know so important because a you have to like the ideas evolve, but then just getting it in front of people and seeing how they react to it. And it's not because like you want to get tell them your ideas are wrong. You have to know if the idea thing you have in your head is actually you know registering with them it's actually impacting and if it's not 
that's your fault. That's, you know, that's your fault. It's our fault, my fault, your fault as a, as a developer. And our job then is, I think people say, well, you go to focus groups and the focus groups tell you what to do. It's not that at all, or play testing. It's usually it's not that. Sometimes you realize you have some really stupid ideas. Um, but usually it's, they're not getting the thing I'm trying to say. And it's never their fault if they're not getting it. It's never that they're idiots. It's always, totally. it's, it's, you're in the wrong key, you know, you're, you're, and, and you always, and tell me, I, Raph, I was thinking, uh, curious as to your thoughts, you always overestimate how easy it is for the player to, to be able to understand what you're getting across. Yeah, I remember those uh, blind tests as, um, uh, you know, we saw the first time at Valve, actually, <clears throat> we're looking at them when they were doing a Half-Life 2, uh, and, it, we learned from them back, back in the days and then we applied that to our own game and it's it's so interesting to see that you think the players are seeing what you what you want them to see you, they, there's the door there's a light pointing at the door and yet they, they don't go through the door and, um, and and you don't understand as a game developer and, and you, you got the rule is that you have to stay sty- silent because the, the, those testers are playing the game you can't say anything and you have like five or six people all the leads around on the screen and being anxious because they they, <laughs> they, they they witness the horror that is the player lost, you know, because he, he, the player did not see the key on the table. And uh, and it's really, uh, it's humbling every time. And there's no, as you said, uh, there's no other solution that, than, than that it's our problem. It's not, it's never, it's never going to be the player's fault. He, they, they, they feel like, like a bunch of dumbasses when they can't find it. They're almost apologetic, like, I'm sorry, I can't find where to go. I'm like, where, where is that? We are sorry, you know, we're sorry that you, that, that we haven't been good enough. You and I know that, and it's sometimes it's hard to express, um, often people and even people from the industry, frankly, uh, whether it's the more business-oriented people, they will always say like, why in the in the movie industry, the people are able to come up with a script written by one person and then they uh, they do the story the storyboard and then apply the thing and then you see the, the movie cut and it's pretty much relatable and it's pretty much there already on the paper. Why can't you do that too in the video game industry? And, um, and it's, it's a very hard question to answer because it seems like, yeah, you're right. Why can't we do that? Now I got a million reasons, but uh, I, I wonder if you've you've had that question before. Well, I never had somebody fortunately ask me that question, like why can't you do it? I, I think they may have asked it in the form of why is it taking so long, right? But you know, I haven't had the question compared to movies. So I think the movie question actually is pretty easy. Um, one is the games are a moving target because you don't know what the player is doing and you don't even know what they're looking. Right? A movie is is a reproducible thing. Right, and yeah. so while every audience can have a different reaction to the film, you can literally shave, you know, you know, shave three frames off of a shot, and um, it'll change the feeling of the shot. And you'll be able to tell right away, very quickly. Like even if you and I are just sitting around, we're tuning something, and like, you know, I'm sure we've both have been through this experience a lot. You're tuning a sequence, you're trying to get the timing, you know, of it right. You don't know if the person's going to let go of the stick, look to the left turn around, walk backwards, and you've got this big moment waiting for them, the moment, you know, you know, Andrews Ryan standing there with a golf club, you know, and you got it, you're, you're waiting for this, but they may just say, you know, they just may be looking down at their shoes or on their phone while the cutscene starts. And, oh, um, you know, and then you're, and then you're kind of screwed. So a lot of <laughs> the work and the reason it takes so long is, techniques to get the player to look where you want them to look, especially in a game like, you know, games we make, I don't think we do a lot of sort of cutscenes. You know, we have a lot of in-world storytelling in both of our games. And making sure the player sees that thing in a world where they're running around and like shooting people and like getting lost and getting turned around. And that takes work. And there's a, we have a whole bag of tricks to do it, but we can't just yeah. like, you know, like Spielberg can just take their face and turn them right this way and have them look at these exact, you know, um, images on the screen. Yeah. But that's also a problem for us, but it's also a huge advantage for us because we have that sense of, of discovery that movies never going to have, you know, that pe- people see something, they catch a story beat. And I actually think, like, I'm always amazed 
like how much retention people have of like audio logs and like in like System Shock 2 and Bioshock because frankly they're pretty you know that people follow the story as much as they do I and mean, I think it's not because the story is particularly well written I think it's more due to the fact that the format that the guys in System Shock 1 came up with of finding this still you know the story beat you know that you found that's yours you're like oh it's mine this is mine yeah. I just found it up. it's special I'm gonna listen to it versus something that you know everybody else is seeing in exactly the same way there's a there's a, a value to put to it and they may be you know drifting off on a cutscene but they're paying attention to this audio lot because it's they got it and they got it this way and they chose to sit in that corner while the big daddy's walking by you know listen yeah. to their ear and listen to it totally it's very personal right it's uh yeah you put it you put it uh in in uh, in good words together i agree um uh, which leads me to uh why why do you think you do games you know you come you come from uh you used to write for plays and you decided eventually uh that games would be more interesting to you i assume like more there's something that attracted to to you you, you were attracted to games why why do you think you make games today well, what's what's so powerful to you for, about games i wish i could say it was like originally some like great artistic goal but i kind of you know i was a playwright and there was no money in that and then i tried to be a screenwriter and i didn't do as well as i hoped um but i learned a lot and um and i was kind of like out on my ass you know with that kind of flaming out as a uh, as a screenwriter and um i wanted a creative life and i and i never even occurred to me you know Raph, that people i played video games like from the very beginning of the dawn of video games and i was obsessed with them from the moment i encountered them like back when they were black and white pong and you know even before that but it never occurred to me that people made them i'm not really sure why like it never occurred to me that this thing i love was actually lovingly crafted by people it just sort of showed up like a product like you know you don't think about who makes your oreos you know or you know or, or your coke your diet coke but once i realized this um, i remember there was an interview with the looking glass guys in a computer games monthly i think the magazine was and it was like doug and warren and seamus blackley and all those guys tim stelmach and mark leblanc and i remember seeing those guys. i'm like oh that's i guess they make this stuff and they had an ad in, in another magazine i looked at a couple months later you know for in like next gen magazine for a design job there and i was like i don't really know what that is but that sounds good to me And um, so I applied for the job, and for some reason they, you know, flew me out there, and uh, I, I, did, I, you know, interviewed, and I got hired like a week later. And how amazing is it that it was uh, Looking Glass? I mean, you know, it could be the same story with a different company. <laughs> it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. So it's like getting your first job, getting <laughs> working with Spielberg on, you know. That's right. Yeah. On, 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 you know, Raiders Lost Ark or something. You know, I got to work with Doug. And all the people around him, and I got put directly in a room with Doug, and I'm, I'm still not quite sure exactly why I got so lucky, but I got very, very lucky, and I learned. But I was, you know, I was not gonna, not gonna blow my, I was not gonna throw away my shot, as they say, you know. Uh, there, I, I really committed to learning the craft, and fortunately, there were great teachers there to, to help me learn it. Now learning the house of the dead. So can we make uh, a little step back and uh, you mentioned uh, God of War and uh, we're still discussing movies and um, my next point is that games let you build narrative and deliver stories through so many things yet many AAA developers still use long non-interactive cutscenes to highlight specific moments and make their games more emotional through these movie style methods still even considering the amount of popularity of high budget so-called platform sellers it's clear that this is the old and um, conventional way of telling stories and at some point this um, uh, things are going to change um, and at the same time it's the question of people's requ request i mean watching movies is already some sort of habit for i mean for mankind for humanity 
Uh, and adding many cutscenes into a game is probably conniving this habit. Gameplay only games don't have to be necessary Pac-Man or Tetris or something primitive like this. Um, there are games like Soma when you are in full control all the time and it adds so much to the emotions you get from games like this. But Soma and other similar innovative games are usually humble, smaller, less advertised, etc. Still they make a lot of progress for all the other games on the planet. At the same time, uh, taking a sidestep and making a game like that is obviously risky. What do you think about that? Um, you mean risky by making a game that doesn't rely heavily on cutscenes? That is mostly. I, mean, I mean, no, it uh, can be too innovative, you know, to sell well. Let's put it that way. I don't know. Like, I don't think you can be. I don't think you can ever go into something thinking it's going to be too innovative to sell well. It means that it's too innovative and doesn't communicate why it's cool well, right? And the, the sort of the, the more innovative it is, the hard you have, there's more problems to solve. Because like every game design problem is really like, how do I expose why this is cool to the player, right? How do I make it clear why this, why this is valuable to them? Because, you know, they're sitting there, they're giving you their money and they've got, you know, they're now giving you their time. And you've got to you got to work pretty fast, or you're going to lose them. And so I think when you're not innovative, it's easier to understand the impact something you do is going to have on the audience. You know, when you're making a competitive first-person shooter, there's so much data out there, you know, about what works and what doesn't work that you can start from, you know, at least knowing the answer to you know a good 50% of your questions. You know, you may have you know, different modes, you know, if you're buying capture the flag or whatever, you, there's a lot of data out there if you don't know how to make that experience work. Um, and I'm sure there's like, it's to do it great is, you know, is, 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 you know, the space reserved for geniuses because it's always hard to do something great. Some things are easy or you can do something okay or something good, but when you're innovating, you have no idea, like it's usually a complete disaster until it gets remotely good. It's always going to start out because you don't have a, you're working without a, you know, a map. Um, and so it's, it's higher risk, but I also find working in innovative spaces is that innovation, when, if you can get the idea across to the player and they get excited, they will forgive a lot of things. You know, if the game feels fresh and innovative. I mean, look at like Minecraft, right? It was done. It was like a Java you know, web browser thing with, you know, really, you know, strange looking graphics and an interface from, you know, that was like from back in the Apple II days, you know, really not intuitive, really not intuitive, but it was so innovative that people forgave it a lot and it came part, it almost became part of its charm, you know, it's very rudimentary nature. Um, but if that was, you know, a first person shooter, you know, that was competitive first person World War II shooter, no, there's no way people would have forgiven that stuff. So you kind of have to choose your battles and you have to know what you're good at. Are you really good at a guy? Are you like, I'm not the guy. I don't think we're asked the guy who's like, oh, go make, you know, you know, Call of Duty, you know, X, because I won't have the patience to get that level of perfected polish down on every single element like they have to do. And that takes a huge amount of work. I don't have that skill set either, but if you give me a more, something that, you know, that's newer, I can, I do better at finding ways to entertain the players in slightly different ways than other people have, but they'll be somewhat forgiving of, of, of its, of its flaws, a little more forgiving. And that's more in my sort of personality than, than something like yeah. making Call of Duty multiplayer. Game. Yeah, I, I agree very, very much. I think, um, it's a different kind of hard, but it's also a more satisfying hard, I think, uh, when you get to innovate and try new things and impress people with not much, uh, rather than, you know, making the best version of what already exists out there is not as exciting to me, frankly. Uh, and it's also like, yeah, it's just not the same budgets as well. It's a different, it's a different kind of game that you're going for. Uh, speaking of, uh, you, uh, I, th 
I, I know, I think at least, uh, you're very interested in um, um, like new ways to, you know, the future of storytelling, or if not the future, but like some advancement in um, maybe uh, some stuff that is more generated and less just uh, entirely pre-authored. Um, I've, you know, I've played with that myself on uh, on, on, on Weird West right, lately, and uh, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing. You know, I, I I look at wouldn't it be great if the same way physics were an, a huge breakthrough back in the days when uh, you know uh, physics were about you would throw an item in the world and it would bounce on things and touch another one and this other thing would do this other thing etc and it would create some sort of a, a little moment and uh, it wouldn't be great if we could do the same with story right where you do something somewhere and it has consequences that are actually generated as opposed to pre-authored and and therefore every player get their own thing i mean in the genre of immersive sims that would be pushing it to the next level that's that's what that's kind of like the holy grail i assume the solution is somewhere like between some of it being authored and some of it being like uh, dynamic on top of all of that. What, what's your, um, what, what have you, uh, what's your vision with that? What's, what are your dreams? What are your expectations or your hopes? I mean, <clears throat> have you played with um, GPT-3 at all? It's general purpose AI. Yeah. They have basically dynamically, and this is not what I'm working on at all. So like, I don't, I don't, I don't, but I'm not saying this is an interesting thing I've observed. Um, there's, they basically have like, uh, it's an it's a general purpose AI and it has like a there's a, a a like a infocom style game you can play on it right, but it's completely arbitrary. Like you set up the situation you want, it responds to all your input in a fairly generative way, um, and it's all text too. And the way it does that is by you know using in the same way Google you know like they enhance 4K videos you know out of like 16 millimeter or 8 millimeter tapes they they find they scrub you know the the, the data set the massive data set of the internet and find RPG and discovers all the RPGs out there and all the tropes for it and then it can look at what you're doing and trying to do and it looks for similar types of things and then it makes its best guess at generating at it now that's um, like it works better than you'd think, but it's not, you know, it's not fully ready for prime time. And I think everybody who's interested in generative storytelling should check it out. But then there's, you know, but that's unaided by people except for the database that it's drawing from, right? You know, like all, mm -hmm. all, all data scraping draws out of the massive database of all the information we have out in the world that's on the internet. I think there's, a, you know, another, you know, uh, there's another approach which is more human oriented that is how do you sort of combine <clears throat> you know game stories is generated by things like you know like XCOM right XCOM generates a game story that's different and you can tell that story though it's not but they don't support it with lang with work with dialogue and all that stuff that's you know but you can tell the story or even civilization you know those games are sort of generative narrative games in some ways or like crusader kings 2 i think you know does stuff like that but it tends to exist in the realm of strategy games um and the stories tend to be fairly uh presented in a fairly rudimentary you know rudimentary fashion and there's no real there's no even attempt at sort of getting into like a well a well crafted scene you know um that's sort of well beyond its capacity i think there's interesting um that's a space i'm interested in you know like how do you get that and i think that's really gonna come by people trying and failing and trying and failing it's a hard problem and i think a lot of people have underestimated it over time it's an easy problem to underestimate but how do you get something to feel like it's a story but you know if you look at um story has structure you know like we talked about the ref you talked about the three-act structure before three-act structure is you know um something that is once you know what it is you know that every movie almost every popular movie is built on this structure and then it's got substructure underneath that and there are rules so it's based upon rules and the rules 
we're figuring out sort of by back solving from what people enjoy. But like, you know, why do we enjoy music? Like, why do we enjoy a certain type of musical resolution, like a 5 1 resolution? You know, we do, we know that, right? So then it was figuring out what a, what a 5 what a five one was, right? And what, you know, and, and what are chords and what are notes and, and how you make these things that satisfy us. We don't know why they satisfy us. But we know what they do, and once we do, you can then in, write instructions. Music's, you know, like non-vocal music is, you know, you can do fairly good generative non-vocal music. It's missing that thing, you know, that thing in humans we don't quite understand that makes art, art. But I don't know. I mean, there's probably some kind of code for it deep down because we're just, you know, we're just DNA creatures of code right just enacting things and finding patterns and codes in the world and you know everything seems you know i may be getting out of my uh, pay grade here but the universe keeps keeps seeming to suggest it's coded nature you know the more we discover about whether it's fractals or or um dna you know there seems to there you know or um or, um, you know, Fibonacci spirals. Um, you know, there seems to be underlying mathematics to everything. And I wouldn't be surprised if drama is um, not immune from that. Yeah, I'm waiting for the movie that is going to uh, take some of the premises you mentioned and the phi number and all that and uh, turn it into something that is really, really mind blowing, but hasn't happened yet, but I'm sure it will at some point. I think it's a super hard problem. Um, And maybe it's a paradigm shift problem. I mean, that's why I want you guys to check out GPT-3 um, it, because it's, it is the paradigm shift because it uses sort of neural, neural network database technology to try to create a human-like thing. Um, but it's, you can feel the soul not being there, but one day, who knows? Yeah. But also, you know, I hate it for it to work too well because then you, what are you and I gonna do? That's exactly what I was gonna say. It's like, I don't know if it's even desirable. <laughs> yeah. You know, what I'd like better though is uh, something where, you know how in our kind of game specifically, we like to write, not, I mean, whether it's the mega story or the, the, the you know, the overarching story or, or more micro stories, we like to write stories that have some consequences and we can only plan for so many of them. But wouldn't it be nice if once the story has been authored to some level, then there is something that can go deeper and can take more, you know, can take more parameters into consideration and more consequences and, and, and you know, it would simplify our life as scripters and level designers to some degree. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, you can make enough Um, you know, like physics simulations, you used that example early on, you know, when you get enough things going, you know, can really create the illusion of life, whether that's hair simulation, right? Which is, you know, done through physics simulation or water simulation and all these other things. And, and those, you know, make patterns that we recognize. And that's all it's trying to do, right? It's trying to make patterns that the human eye recognizes and it starts off very crude and then becomes more and more sophisticated. But, you know, physics simulation is has that advantage of being you know the math was figured out you know 300 years ago or 400 years ago by, you know by newton and the calculus um we haven't you know cracked that code on on, on on what makes you know what makes an ending right you know what what is it what makes a satisfying ending like what is the code for yeah. a satisfying ending you know and the endings are particularly hard because life doesn't really have endings you know in the same way that stories do and so there's always that's why i think they're always kind of feel artificial or they often can feel artificial endings um and certainly you know when you look back on it um, you know a happy ending you want you know I, i always like watching like a romantic comedy from the 80s and then you're like you know it's a meg ryan and tom hanks or something and there's a the happy ending like and you think well what? what's like 40 years from that look like you know what does that look like because there's no end <laughs> no romantic comedy happy ending um and um i think that we still have a way to go to figure out how to you know how to solve those artificial problems that only appear in stories and don't appear in the world but i think the goal like you were talking about cutscenes earlier Raf, 
I got to think, and this is what I thought my whole career and the reason I wanted to pursue these problems, because I got to think the future is not scriptedness, you know? I can't see a world, and I think that over time I've been, you know, that my instinct has, has not been super wrong. Um, and, you know, your instinct too, I think, from the kinds of games you want to make. Um, it's moving away from that. And how do we get to something that feels natural but also dramatically satisfying? And I could be wrong. It could be we're trying to move to like the ultimate scripted sequence that blows away movies. But I don't really care about that because then, then you know, then you're giving up so many strengths of what your medium has to try to, you know, pursue this other medium. I think games have a bit of a problem. It's like you watch some of the award shows and it's like full of like Hollywood celebrities, you know, and I'm like, well, what, 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 what are we, we kind of feel insecure, you know, I think that the medium is somewhat um, lesser as a storytelling medium. And I never worried about that. You know, I was always mm -hmm. like, once I, once I got into games and I realized, unlike movies, that the um, opportunities, you know, the, the, the opportunity space is so much bigger because it was such a new medium and it still is. And we still, still haven't really cracked it yet in the way that yeah, movies yeah. have been pretty well cracked. And now it's like, can I just do a great movie? You know, um, we're still really, you know, chewing at the skin of the apple. Oh yeah, I I agree very much. The, it, it, so, so much that sometimes I feel like we are, as an industry, and some and to some degree, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that big big games are trying to mimic movies more and more, and they corner themselves into less interactivity and more realism, and and uh, and, and trying to reach that. Uh, that performance, you know, that brings those like characters to be so lively and with the, the little tear on the on the eye and all of that. But ultimately, it also it, it's it's a trap. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to make those games, uh, and because then you focus all your effort on that and that, and and less on what actually games could offer. Uh, we, we we already know that games were so incredibly emotional in the '90s, frankly. Uh, with a level of fidelity that was pretty pretty poor compared to what we can have today, uh, and sometimes I, 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 it's not that I worry because I, I myself reshifted my attention on on um, what matters more to me uh, as a game developer, which is the depth and, and the kind of things that I can. How can I touch the player without really worrying about do I see the nice hair through the wind and the the sun and all that? You know, which is kind of a bit of a trap. Well, you know, I think you do. I, I've sort of never been an absolutist. I don't think you have been either in saying, well, you know, I'm I'm a video game artist and I'm never going to leverage, you know, you know, a, a dramatic moment, you know, that you might find in, 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 in a movie. Because I think everything you have is a tool you know, like three act structure, for instance, was an easy, was true, I could just transfer over. Um, now maybe it's a limitation, like it could, there is a world where it's a limitation. I mean, that's, I never really thought about that, that maybe the fact that I had three act structure in the bag was um, a limiting factor. You know, there's this term I like called the genius of the novice. And it's people, you know, often figure out how to do things when they don't know what they're doing because they're not down by any, any, you know, by any expertise and you know most of the time it's 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 an obstacle but you can have those moments like i don't know if i would have made system shock 2 the way we made it if i had never made a game before if i had made other game finished shipped other games before maybe i would have learned some lessons that would have put me in a different direction maybe that game would have been a different game better who knows maybe worse um but so yeah i think i think you can leverage these things and use them and you try to feel, you know, like, you know, what does it feel right for the moment? I'm, you know, what I'm trying to get across here, but I think maybe, yeah, maybe you're, it's hard to know if it's actually holding you back. Yeah. yeah. And how do you, how do you, how do you like do that? How do you like decide, how do you decide what tool to draw out of the tool chest? Um, I think in, in my case, and in the case of you know the company I'm with right now, uh, Wolfi, we um, we decided to constraint constraint ourselves 
by saying we're going to make a game uh, that with this type of budget. And so what it means is that our characters are going to have this amount of polygons. And that's it. <laughs> and uh, this way we don't fight the wrong battles in our, in our mind. You know? And that frees us from... Uh, while we are, of course, like every developer, every artist, we are attracted to beautiful things and uh, a strong art direction because it, it's, it's a good first tool to convey a lot of things. Uh, but there's a diminishing return, to my mind, of uh, trying to put 10 people on one character and getting all the detail right uh, versus taking those 10 people and uh, trying to develop some other stuff that is uh, a little more uh, things that people haven't done before, you know, things that are uh, more into like how deep can we go with interactivity or how much can we recognize what the player has done and turn it into some sort of a callback for the player's uh, experience so that they feel like the, the experience belonged to them. That, that to me has more meaning. Um, so that's, I would say, the way we, we uh, reserve and unleash some, some chances, some power uh, to, to, to make something interesting is to actually start with constraints in, in our case. That's, that's the decision we made. I don't know if it will work. <laughs> yeah, we, um, and the constraints change over time, like, you know, um, I remember the first game I worked on that got canceled when I was at Looking Glass it was a Star Trek game, and I and I wrote the opening cutscene. Like you know, they on Star Trek they used to have like that before the credits they'd have some you know big thing like they encounter some space space station or something, and then they find it's like you know I don't know another copy of Captain Kirk is on the space station, and they're all, and it's a big mystery, and they go to first commercial. I was writing that sequence for this Star Trek Voyager game, you know, they, I can't remember what it was, but, you know, but it was very much like screenwriting and I was in my, you know, in my wheelhouse because it was just like this animated sequence because um, I wrote it. I remember saying, you know, Janeway sees, the captain sees this thing on the view screen that's coming towards him like an attack or something. And I say, we, you know, we push in on her face and her eyes widening with terror or something like that. And I remember Rob Fermier, I think you know, um, who was the lead programmer, just pulls me aside, he goes, like, here's Janeway's face. And it was like 16 pixels by 16 pixels. <laughs> the Sierra style game. And he's like, those eyes are not gonna widen in terror. You know, and immediately I was like, oh, okay. You know, it's only the first couple of weeks at working in a game company. And uh, it was a great lesson because I realized like you have to take the thing you have, not the thing you wish you had. That's right. And you yeah. got to make the most out of that. Yeah. If you think you have more than you actually do, you're going to completely, completely screw the pooch. So knowing what you have, like knowing, you know, the characters and the polygons you have and all those things, and then sticking with that forces you to figure out how to use those things, you know, best possible way you can yeah uh what you just said uh even though it's a little bit of a tangent but uh i you know isn't it weird how we all have so many um little scenes like that or work or piece of design or ideas that were like we fought for we talked in teams we had meetings about and those disappeared and they will never be made, right? They're, they are like somewhere in our, like they're all so, all so much effort and passion and love put to, together on it and, um, and they will never see the day. Or maybe they will be recycled someday. I don't know, like I found when I cut something, like I had an experience recently where we had something in the game for a while and um, it was like two in the morning and I was just sitting in this, in my in my chat at night i usually med meditate before i go to bed and well started that you know a couple years ago and i'm sitting in this chair this nice leather chair i have to meditate in lights are out and i couldn't get calm I couldn't like i couldn't calm down and it was like this voice was telling me like you know there's something wrong there's something wrong there's something wrong and i realized this feature i've been trying to get right for like a very long time that i was just convinced was going to work because on me, you know, you know, I had the idea. And all of a sudden, like the voice said to me is like, that's your vanity, man. That's <laughs> your vanity. And very clearly, and all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, what the, what the hell have I been doing? 
and it's not like a, the major feature in the game. It's but something we spent a lot of time on, and everybody tried really, really hard. Everybody gave it their best, and just my the idea which came from me just wasn't good. And because it came from me, I would have seen it much sooner if it came from someone else. And, and then keeping yourself honest with that stuff is so hard to do, and it's so important. It's very hard. Is yeah, it's very hard and very important. And at the same time, it's hard because sometimes you're right, and it's it's hard to know when you're right to insist on something or you're not right. <laughs> I mean, like when you're the creative director, who's going to tell you? You know, you can listen to people. Yeah. Like, Because I've had ideas that, you know, the Big Daddy was an idea that I was certain about. And people on the team were, some people on the team didn't have the same belief. And there's no reason why they should have, because they didn't see it in my head as I did. But and I could have been wrong, too, right? You know, like, yeah, like just yeah. trying out that, but together with the team and choosing the right people to work on and to bring it to life turned out to be right. But, you know, most, never nobody sees the, you know, the horrible, mutilated, you know, uh, Uh, cast castaways that we toss off during production. They always want to, you know. Did you guys seen that rant that people want to see like the cut stuff? Yeah, it's like we cut it for a reason. We <laughs> cut it for a reason. Yeah, sometimes it's because time. Sometimes it's just because of time. But most of the time, it's most of the time it's it's because it sucks. <laughs> but time is not, you know, like a, a great idea without time is not a great idea. Uh, yeah, that's right. Time to execute on it properly because it's going to sometimes, you know, how long is it going to take? Like, how long until people realize Dig Daddy got developed enough that people realize that I, that I wasn't insane about it? And you don't know. And then one day, you know, it, it, well, either it never happens and then you have to decide, like, this isn't going to work and you cut it or we don't have enough time, like you said, or you get, you wake up that morning and suddenly it, it's doing what you hoped it would do. But that does that day doesn't come for every idea. That's right. It's very true. And it's also depending on your team and how much they how much the magic happened between you and the team and you know, it's it's a lot of a lot of parameters. So it's, that's why it's so hard to make games. Now loading the house of the dead. Yeah. There's another little thing uh, I wanted to ask both of you, actually. Um, in many stories, there's an important part which probably can be called the commentary. I mean, for a simple example, when an author tells me something and immediately tells me what it means without giving me some time to interpret. Uh, the bad example is probably The Last of Us Part 2. Uh, when this game came out, I've seen a lot of people complaining about the things this game forced them to do against their will as gamers. But the game insisted because its authors wanted to deliver a specific message uh, through, uh, though, uh, through tying uh, the hands of the gamers. On the other hand, we got Deus Ex Mankind Divided, uh, and uh, there's a scene when you find your own body in a container during a bank robbery and the game tells you nothing there's no quest that activates when you see what you see there's no dialogue happening because of this there's no you know voiced over thoughts of the main character uh, it's just you and your feelings and your impression but in the end speaking of endings I mean people need that final chord and this probably is a commentary by itself And maybe uh, that's why it l may look artificial. Can we talk about this balance? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's hard to make the player do something they don't want to do, you know? And I think that the experiment in Last of Us was really interesting, right? Because it was, I think it was them trying to say, Let's try that, right? I'm sure they knew. Or actually, I can't be sure because you never, you never know. Nice things come out and they don't appear in testing. Um, and I think they were taking a chance, you know, a big chance. And I think that's good. I think people need to take chances because otherwise you just don't know. Um, but I love the notion of, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of, of a bit of ambiguity. Um, like you said, with the Deus Ex thing, uh, with the um, the, de with the Deus Ex thing, like, what does that mean? You know, when you see that, like, you know, it means something. Um, what does it mean? 
and sort of leaving the player with that, I think, is one thing that games do. That's another way to subvert expectations without sort of telling the player like you have to play this way. It's all of a sudden it's like you realize something is happening and you have no. The tricky part is then, like in the SX game, you have dialogue. Do you know? Does do you give the opportunity for you to pursue that mystery through speech? Which is why I tend to stay away from dialogue trees and things like that in games because I always get frustrated because I can't ask the thing I want to ask. You know, I always have to ask the choices, and that even though it's a affordance that lets me ask questions, it feels so misshapen compared to the, my my ability to do that in language. Where when I'm running around and shooting things, that feels like a fairly good approximation. Of what I could do in real life. Well, of course, I'm not nearly as athletic as you know characters in, in a video game. We're running like 40 miles an hour and you know, doing amazing things, <laughs> taking deep bullets. But the basic thing feels about right. You know, opening doors feels about right, even though it's not 100 right. Opening, you know, picking things up feels about right, even though there's a layer of abstraction. But dialogue is tough, you know, for for that for me, and that's why I, as a gamer, I never loved it. Um, dialogue choices, I mean. Um, and as a developer, I've stayed away from that. Yeah, I think it's also it's so the case of uh, Last of Us versus the Deus Ex example. It's a creative choice, but it's also a sales choice. Frankly, I believe uh, I I'm way more in, in favor of the subtle letting the player conclude whatever they want and finding this little nugget. Uh, they, they feel so it's feels so powerful right um, and when you never force the player to do things but at the same time that, that might be the, the gamer and the creative in me that says that not the not the business person or or the uh, you know the mass market I think I think maybe for mass market that there's a reason why those games do the things that do the, the the way they do them, um, and you know, take the hand of the player, force into a mini cinematic, and have things happening. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. At a, at a strict core level of what touches me, I, I definitely prefer things that um, are my experience. You know, that's why like we 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 put a lot of effort, even in prey, to to get the player to break that glass in this balcony and, and like there was no nowhere we would take the control of the player because it we knew that it would feel amazing to the player to do that like with no cinematic he's the cinematic you know and uh, so that I, I always value that way way more but it's so hard to do so hard to do there's just and i'm sure you've had this experience that there's so many times you just like screw it let's just take control away from the player and it's, <laughs> almost, it's almost always a mistake okay. And it's better to go back and say, like, how can we do this without, or, or at least fool them. Like, you know, we use a lot of affordances in our games, like, you know, knocking the player to the ground, you know, things like that. So you have a moment where, you know. You control it, yeah. But yeah. there's a reason, there's an, you've set an expectation of why they would have lost control versus just the, yeah. those games where they just lock you in a room, you know, sitting in place and uh, you can't move or talk or, do, yeah. or can't do anything. Yeah, but I wonder how much, uh, and I agree a hundred percent with you on like it's it triggers me if I think about it. You know, ah, ah, no, this is a no, no, like this is a big. But I wonder how much the market cares about that. You know, but I mean, I I, I don't do things just for the market. You and I really care about as developers, and I care about as a gamer. Like I really want the game to respect my time, and it's really important to me. Like that's why those old JRPGs, as much as I love them. Man, like, you know, Final Fantasy Tactics, I love that game, sitting through those cutscenes, you know, with the dot, dot, dot drawing out. It just drives me insane because... That's right. I, I want the game to move at my pace, not the other way around. Um, I'm not sure the market really cares that much, but it's hard to say because I think there's some intangibles that come out of it. People feel maybe they won't say it, like they won't say like, oh, Ken, nobody's ever come to me and said, oh, Ken. Let me tell you, the reason your games are great is you, they don't really have traditional cutscenes. That's why they're great. You know, there's usually, oh, I like the art or I like the story or I like the combat, whatever. Nobody says that, but maybe they don't know it. At least I hope so, because I spent, you know, it sounds like you know, both Raph and I both spent a huge amount of time trying to solve these problems of how do we keep the players to do the thing we need them to do without taking control away from them. 
it's a huge, it's a huge undertaking. Yeah. Yeah, I always wonder how much of it is a self-imposed uh, challenge. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I love where it. Did you, where did it come from for you? Like what? Like when did you get that sense? Is it playing Looking Glass games? I mean, uh, yeah, I think I think. Uh, oh wow, it, it goes all the way back to. Uh, it, it's weird though because I mean I was a big fan of Underworld and Underworld has dialogue and all that, but uh, so. It's not so much of a must, or even Deus Sex, Deus Sex of Dialogue. Yet, I think, um, I just realized that, I think Thief and uh, uh, System Shock 2, uh, but also even, even just Half-Life, you know, Half-Life 2, uh, that elegance that they had about That's it, yeah. not pushing anything on your face, uh, and, and uh, it just felt so smooth, so good, and uh, like never be interrupted. And that's, what's, uh, that's what we tried with, uh, with Prey. We just said, like, okay, for Prey, we're just going to remove absolutely on any form of, uh, of interruption. Um, and, um, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's, it became a little pet peeve of mine. It doesn't mean that I will always respect it in all of my games but uh if i can i will you know it feels good I, it's something that i really, really respond well to yeah it would save a lot like if i wish somebody could come along and say nobody cares like that would, that would make my life a lot easier <laughs> you know that for sure because then i could just yeah. like, i would get 10 years back in my life if if <laughs> if somebody would tell me that but i don't know it's really important to me i'm going back from playing you know you know, I think System Shock won, you know, with the audio log. So it's like, you know, because mm -hmm. Underworld, the story wasn't really anything, but I didn't care about the story. I was just like wandering around. But System Shock, I cared about the story because it wasn't getting in my way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I realized that in most RPGs, um, and frankly, even the sex that I loved so much, uh, there was there would be a moment where I go skip, 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 skip. Uh, and and in a way, it's a, it's sad, you know, uh, I, I, which is why the audio logs were such a powerful uh, invention, where it just plays on top of your own gameplay, and now you feel like you're not wasting your time, and you don't want to skip it because it's it's you know it's, it informs you about something while you're still playing anyway. Uh, and yeah, I really love that approach. So yeah, uh, I can tell you uh, that um, your games, uh, both Ken and Raf. Your games, one of the main reasons that your games are great is that they don't have cutscenes. Thank you very much. <laughs> we did it for you. And it's cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah, it's probably. Is it cheaper, really? I'm not sure about that, actually. I think so. I think so, because. Uh, if if you if you if you look at you know we did have a lot of cutscenes in uh, in Dishonored 2 in fact and and uh, and if they were not cutscenes they were at least non interactive cutscenes <laughs> where you had like to uh, to coordinate some mo -ca motion capture where the people would grab an object hand it to someone else oh this is like so heavy to do um, and they are they fall into the cutscene category but whenever you choose a context like in Bioshock where everybody's dead kind of uh, or there are only crazy people on, in, in the area, or the same with Prey, everybody's dead and there's a few crazy people around. Uh, it, you, you mechanically have less of that. And, and it's, you know, it's, some of it is a choice, <laughs> because I, I don't want to have to deal with that. Uh, and some of it is also like creative, a creative choice, because it's, you know, it provides for a great atmosphere. But uh, I don't think players see the cheap trick here, <laughs> which is to avoid cinematics. <laughs> Yeah, we, we originally, like Bioshock Infinite originally was sort of set in a, you know, a dead world as well. And then we sort of like, kind of, oh, you know, are we just playing the same trick over again? We decided to sort of, it wasn't like an open world fully interactive, but there's lots of living characters, like, you know, the city hadn't fallen. And I can't tell you how, what that cost. Like just, just that one decision yeah. made that game so much harder to make. Like getting that scene, you know, when you first in the, I just remember like the scene where you first with Elizabeth on the beach and your first time you're walking around with her around in a populated world. Just getting that, we were we were working on that thing for like eight, two years. That that one sequence to get it right, and then we use that to figure out how to do the rest of it. Um, but you know, we couldn't we could we couldn't afford to do an Assassin's Creed style thing. We had to sort of mill people milling around. So it was all very much, and I'm not even sure it was a good idea even with doing it because it because they were limited you know they didn't 
you know, the corpses in System Shock 2 are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. But these sort of people playing, you know, repeating animations feel a little more like a theme park ride um, than living, breathing people. And even in Assassin's Creed, as good as they get, it's still sort of these, you know, meandering machines, right? That, that don't really, you know, you never get to an interesting, you know, moment with them, like you would walking down the street in New York where you're encountering interesting life all the time. They're really automatons. So sometimes it's better just not to ask the question. Totally. Yeah. yeah, that, um, you know, that was quick, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, uh, it was a great pleasure. Uh, thanks for your time, Ken. Uh, Raf, uh, you have, you guys have a nice evening. Uh, and I'm gonna, uh, you, you know, have a nice try, to, try to try to sleep <laughs> a couple of more. Are you in Russia? Yeah. Whereabouts? Moscow. Uh, it's five. 40 in the morning right now we could i didn't realize that we could have done i'm sorry we could have done a different time nah <laughs> that's <laughs> <not>. fine <laughs> i love staying up to five I, you know uh, yeah i didn't comment on e3 this year and i did not um, do this last year so this is the uh, you know the price to pay <laughs> and it's a great <laughs> opportunity <laughs> if we do it again we'll do it we'll do, we'll do it at a more human time for you okay okay Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, it was it was a uh, it was a blast talking to you again. It, it had been at least two or three years, I believe. I think it has. Um, yeah, time goes time goes really fast. And uh, yeah, talk to you soon again. Um, have a good have a good evening. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.